Tony Ann from Brooklyn, New York, has a question. My son has or had behavioral problems in a public school and also does now in a private school. His behavior severely impacts his academics. How can I get him to control his anger? Well, when you're talking about anger versus behavior, it's, it's important to clarify what the behavior is because behavior is, is nonverbal communication. So whatever the behavior is, you got to figure out what is your son trying to tell you. And again, anger either comes from fear or frustration, which tells you there's something not working for this child, that the child's having difficulty putting into words, that if the words were there, the behavior would not be necessary. So again, it comes down to figuring out what in that environment is not working for this child. Help them process it. Help them find the language. And then when they start to use the language, reward that, saying, thank you so much for explaining it to me. Now I understand what you need. Now I can support you. But in the absence of that language, they're just going to act until somebody figures it out. Right. Here's kind of a similar um, question from Anita in Lawrence, Kansas. Actually, it's more about having um, problems understanding what's going on with her child because the child's not communicating. Brian, I've been hearing you say, ask your child why if they don't like something, but my six-year-old child is unable to let us know why when we ask her what's bothering her. So how do I get her to explain? Well, and I'm taking for granted that the child is, is verbal. If the child can't explain you know, very articulately, that there's one thing a child knows, what they like and what they don't like. So you can ask, do you like this or do you not like this? And keep it very black and white, very concrete at first, especially for the younger kids. Because they don't have a lot of insight into I, I get upset or I feel sad because a lot of Spectrum kids really don't have that kind of emotional awareness, but they do have that basic like and dislike. So first, just start very simply. Do you not like it when this happens or do you like it better when that happens? Those are simple yes or no questions. And the child should be able to identify those. Okay, that sounds like a good starting point. Here's the question from Anna in New York. She's a special educator. I have worked with children on the spectrum. Last year I had a little girl who was on the spectrum. She was four years old. She was very good at numbers and could recognize letters and numbers. However, her social skills and language skills for her age were below age level. She was not diagnosed because she was too young. Uh, now, how old the child needs to be to have a diagnosis? How is it okay? So, how old does a child need to have a diagnosis, and how is Asperger's different from being a savant? Well, in, in terms of age, it has everything to do with how pronounced the characteristics are. If they're really, really obvious, then you can pretty much call it what it is. But in some cases, with the kids, they're much more subtle. And you don't know whether it's just developmental and the child just needs a little time to catch up and mature. So there are a lot of diagnosticians who will hesitate because they're just not sure, because the characteristics aren't as pronounced. So sometimes they'll say, well, you know, the child's a little young. Let's just call it PDD-NOS, which is pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. It, it's the umbrella term for the autism spectrum. Then they'll say, okay, we'll follow up in three years, and if those things still persist, then they'll call it Asperger's. So sometimes it's the judgment of the professional, and sometimes it's just maybe it's the not professional. They don't know what they're seeing. They think it's just a quirky child. Now, savantism uh, can occur with a spectrum or can occur without the spectrum. Savantism is basically an area of exceptional skill that can basically not be accounted for by learning, like somebody's really good at fixing a car because they practice and practice and practice. A savant skill is something that you basically just have. You're just able to do it. Like the people who are able to hear music and they sit down and play on the piano even though they've never had a lesson. They can solve really complex mathematical problems in their brain, even though they've really not had too much exposure to math. Their brain is just wired for it. That's typically a, a savant skill. Uh, one of the things I'm realizing about myself is I'm somewhat of a verbal savant. With my ability to translate all of my thought and my experience into spoken word. And that's probably one of the reasons I've been able to operate so effectively in my role as an ambassador, 
because there isn't anything I can't explain. If I understand it, I can explain it to anybody. I can explain it to a four-year-old, or I can explain it to an 80-year-old. I just have that ability. However, I need to count in my fingers to do mathematical equations. I have difficulty organizing. My short-term memory is garbage. I need to write everything down. So when people hear me speak, they say, oh, you're so accomplished and you're so articulate. I'm like, yeah, but don't be fooled. That's, that's my savant skill. I'm very good verbally, but I am disproportionately skilled like anybody else on the spectrum. So my ability to verbalize and articulate often fools people. They, they don't believe that I have challenges in these other areas because if you can communicate, you must be intelligent, you know. Not to say that I'm, you know, not intelligent, but that just happens to be my area of expertise. Right. And thank goodness for us that you have it. Okay. April G. from Kenwick. This is quite a long question. Is there a specific test we can ask for to get a diagnosis of Asperger's? We really believe our four-year-old daughter has Asperger's. The school psychologist and autism expert don't think so. We took her to a neuropsychologist and his team of specialists who evaluated her, but we, were, but we were not impressed with them. They said they don't think she's on the spectrum because she is too verbal, too social. Emma has just started seeing an OT who told us Emma has SPD, that's sensory processing disorder. We were grateful to find someone who understands this disorder because we thought so too. She also believes Emma has autonomic nervous system disorder unspecified. I asked her if she, in her opinion, thinks that Emma could have Asperger's, and she said yes. She sees some of the characteristics. I don't think Emma's pediatrician is very knowledgeable in these areas. How do we get a doctor to take us seriously? Well, it's possible to have characteristics of Asperger's but not have enough to really fall on the spectrum, because if there's a lot going on with this little girl, she could have a host of challenges going on, and some of them are Asperger's characteristics. But one thing I really want to want to jump on is what the, the neuropsych said. Uh, it was something like she socializes too much and something else. Can you read that part again? Um, yes. Um, she can't be on the spectrum because she's too verbal and too social. All right, uh, with all due respect, that's stupid because there's about 70 or 100 different characteristics on the spectrum. You cannot exclude it because of two things, okay? What does being verbal have to do with being on the spectrum? I mean, if you're autistic, you may have some speech delay or the absence of speech. In Asperger's, there's no measurable speech delay. So if you're talking about Asperger's, Speech delay is not even one of the criteria. So how can they say this child is not on the spectrum because of verbalization? That's irrelevant. And the other part is they're too social. Well, everybody on the spectrum is not a wallflower. There are some children who really make a tremendous effort to socialize. They're just not very effective. So just because a child is out there trying to make friends and trying to socialize and walking up to people doesn't mean they're not on the spectrum. Because it doesn't always mean social fear to be on the spectrum. It means difficulty with social skills. So a child on the spectrum can be an introvert or an extrovert. So this neuropsych really needs to clarify their understanding of what it means to be on the spectrum. Because it's quite possible this little girl is. But this, these people that she's going to, she's absolutely right, don't really seem to understand the criteria well enough to effectively assess this little girl. How do you find the right professional to uh, to do an assessment to find out? Start going, to, they... start going to parent groups and asking around. Listen for the one name that comes up consistently. Uh, you can also go to various websites out there that have a lot of professionals listed throughout the country because usually they don't just – take for granted, oh, somebody said that this doctor was good, so we put them up there. They usually check these people out. You know, when you, when you hear a person's name often enough, there's a good enough reputation, they're consistently good and know what they're doing, that's the person to go for. Right. Okay, good advice. Vanessa in Harbor City wants to know, how can she prepare her autistic son for middle school? I'm afraid of bullying and all the confusion for him with new classes and new people. Well, I always like to say middle school is like going from basic training to Iraq. 
because <laughs> if anything, yeah, if anything is going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong in middle school. Because when you talk about the paradigm shift from grade school, where it's one classroom, maybe one or two teachers, then you go to middle school where you have passing periods, that obnoxious bell, people bumping up against you in the hallway, the cafeteria, uh, new teachers, new people. It's just complete chaos. So it's not only preparing your child for the school, it's preparing the school for your child and saying, right. my child's coming in with these challenges. What can you as a school do to support my child? How can you guys work as a team here? Because we don't want to put it on the child to say, oh, by the way, I'm about to put you into an environment that violates every, everything in your brain that makes sense. It violates your sensory sensitivities in every way, but I want you to be happy there and enjoy yourself. You know, that's not always re reasonable. Sometimes one of the best things you can do for a child is just say, I know it stinks. I know you have a hard time there. I understand it. This is how we're going to support you to help you get through the day. Right. That makes sense. So now, about bullying, though, that's a big whole topic in all of it. In all bullying is a yeah. Bullying is not just a one-on-one -on -one problem. It's a community problem. And this is one thing that I'm going to be working on with uh, the school that I'm going to be training with this week. Is there needs, in my opinion. And I don't know, maybe I'll write a letter to the new president and see if he listens to me. There needs to be a character curriculum in the school. You're not just teaching them how to be good students. You need to also model how to be a good human being. You know, if there are certain values in the classroom, you can't say, okay, we need to practice respect today. How is that being modeled? How is that being recognized? When a child raises their hand and waits on to be called, instead of just calling on a child, say, thank you so much for raising your hand and waiting to be called on, that shows really res real respect for the classroom rules and real consideration. Those kind of things need to be recognized when a child's doing it. When a child shows respect, call them on it. That was wonderful respect you just showed. That was wonderful compassion. Model and support character traits in the school because when the bullies are going to start catching on to what's being rewarded and what's being discouraged. So it's something that the, the school needs to take ownership. It's not just a one-on-one -on -one problem. Right, and it's the principal that really sends a message, the, the, like the captain of the ship. So mm -hmm. it really has to go from the principal on down, don't you think? Right. It, it has to be an institutional value because I've seen too many school situations where they say, boys will be boys, your child needs to learn to stick up for themselves, how come they can't solve their own problems. They minimize it, or even worse, they don't take responsibility as adults to guide children. Because if you have a child on the spectrum who has difficulty initiating a conversation, how on earth are they going to handle the complexities of a bullying situation? You're absolutely right. Now, so they, they, definitely, they definitely need to have more support. Right. But it is. It's a two-way street. They need to have more support, but you also have to um, do some um, peer counseling, not counseling, mm -hmm. the peer training, um, all kinds of things so that it's really just not about telling the person with Asperger's to put up or shut up. Absolutely. Okay, so Deborah Presser from Fresno, California. How do you appropriately discipline our kids? How can we build up low esteem? My son is totally drama he goes to extremes, and in thought, he's usually negative. You know, he thinks that he has no friends and that no one likes him. Uh, so how do you build up self-esteem? Well, basically, the way to build up self-esteem in any child is to give them opportunities to feel competent. Because a child who has low self-esteem is walking around the world feeling like they can't make anything positive happen. They feel they can't do anything right. So any opportunity a child has to feel like they're effective, they did something well, they did something confidently. Then you say, hey, man, look at how well you did that. You did this wonderfully. But unfortunately, the things that Spectrum kids are encouraged to do is all the stuff they're not good at. Here, go and, go and make eye contact. Go and, go and socialize more. Go and play with the friends. They're not supported and encouraged in the things that you know they're good at and can have success at. And I'm not talking about giving them eight hours in front of the video game console because it makes them feel good. You know, there are other things that they can do that will allow them to feel competent. 
But one of the things I do with my three boys is I create situations where success is guaranteed. When you talk about – they like to go to McDonald's a lot. I can rehearse with them what they want to order because you know the person behind the counter is on their side. So they can go up there and say, I want this to eat, and uh, I want this size drink. Oh, okay, well, it, it costs this much money. Hey, that, that was easy. I told them what I want, and I'm going to get it. And I have them exchange the money and get the change back. They just had a social success. Right. So you give them those situations where success is guaranteed and give them that sense of competence, and it starts building up their self-esteem. Now, in terms of saying they have no friends, well, first of all, you, you have to find out what do they think a friend is. Because maybe they have some friends, or maybe they think that somebody who was nice to them for the four days of the week was their friend, but then on the fifth day there was a misunderstanding, and now they're not a friend anymore. Right. So you need to understand what their logic is. Yeah. And what, what, what was the other part of that question? Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, it was There's about discipline. Right. Okay. This is one thing that comes up a lot in my practice. They say, the question is, how much of it is the Asperger's and how much of it is just being a bratty kid? And I said, the question is irrelevant because what it ultimately comes down to is, to what degree did the child have a choice over what they did? Because Asperger's, although informs their choices, does not necessarily determine their choices. You will have a child who does things over and over again and doesn't learn from it because they have poor self-awareness not necessarily because they don't have control over it. So if a child chose to do something, then, of course, there need to be discipline. There needs to be consequences of that. Once it's been explained to the child, this is the rule, this is how you break it, and this is how you honor the rule. And once you know that they understand it, you make sure they say it back to you. Okay, now what is the rule? And what are you not supposed to do? Okay, and if you do what you're not supposed to do, what's the consequence? Once they have explained it to you that they get it, now they understand and you can discipline that. But too many parents say, well, this child should know better. I've said it a hundred times. Yeah, you've said it a hundred times, but how do you know it's sunk in? The child needs to say it back to you, and you need to be on the same page with that child so that it is a shared rule. It's not just your rule imposed upon them. It's something you both understand. You both agree to the consequence. And then when the child breaks the rule <clears> – <throat> They chose to break the rule, and they chose the consequence. So they're taking control of what's happening to them. Because whenever a child is disciplined and they say, oh, that's not fair and, you know, that's unreasonable, it's because they're using the belief that you have done something to them. You're being unfair. You're taking power away. But if they chose with full knowledge to do something, knowing what the consequence would be, then they chose. They chose the consequence, and they chose to be disciplined because that's the conversation you had with them. So you say, no, I'm not being unfair. I'm not being mean. We had a deal. We had this discussion. You did your end. You broke the rule. I'm doing my end by giving you the consequence. We agreed on this. They can't, they can't argue with that. They'll try. That's how I do it with my kids. Yeah, but don't you think it's the same kind of uh, way of dealing with discipline with neurotypical children? I mean, it's all about being clear with what mm -hmm. the rules are, making sure they understand that they buy into it, right. and then them understand that they're responsible for their own behavior. Right. Because they're Be Once you know that they know. Mm -hmm. But you can't... But, yeah, with Spectrum Kids, with, with Spectrum Kids, it's even more so important that it has to be done that deliberately. Okay. Good point. So here, Carrie from Saginaw, or Saginaw, some of these names I know that I'm slaughtering, and I really apologize to the listeners. Hi, Brian. I have two sons, ages 8 and 5, also that have been diagnosed with Asperger's. Sometimes it's the most rewarding, and sometimes the entire day is a battle. The most current battle we're facing right now is social-emotional area. The boys want friends but just don't know how to interact. I am wondering what your suggestions are to help them with appropriate interaction. How did you finally learn the acceptable codes of conduct? Well, the acceptable codes of conduct, as I mentioned before, in uh, grad school 
I learned by watching the people who were effective, and I tried to hang around with them and mimic them as much as possible. But the secret that I finally stumbled upon is successful social interactions are goal-driven, which basically means you don't just go into an interaction just to talk to somebody, because a lot of neurotypical exchanges are like that. They're very open-ended, they're very spontaneous, and they can go any which way and or no way at all, and you can still have a conversation. With Spectrum Kids, it needs to be goal-driven. Every time they approach somebody, they need to know exactly what they want to accomplish in that exchange. Do they want to simply say hi and say hi back? Do they want to ask this person a question and get some information? Or do they want to give this person information and then clarify to make sure that information was received? It has to be very strategic. So if these child want to socialize effectively, they have to know what do they want to accomplish. Talk about it, set a goal, strategize it, then go do it. Wow, that's really good information. Mm-hmm. It's nice when you have a plan like that. When you break it down that way for us, Brian, it's so much simpler. Even though I know it's not always simple to carry out, it makes it clearer. Well, th- I mean, and that's that's how I have basically decoded life because of my logical brain and the way I'm always problem solving things, and because I'm able to explain it. My entire life is lived very deliberately. I do everything on purpose. I made a point of trying to disassemble any of my impulses, any of my habits, because I didn't want to live my life on automatic pilot. I wanted to do things by choice. I don't want to be reactive. I want to be proactive. So I learned how to do things very deliberately, and one of those things is socializing. I always socialize with a purpose. Right. I I mean, I have a question for you, because I have friends with Asperger's who say they don't get chit-chat. And so they have a hard time with that because it doesn't have a purpose to it. Right. Because there's no information exchange in chit-chat. Right. Because chit-chat is just about connection. It's just about acknowledging the other person. People on the spectrum, they want to give information or they want to get a question answered. And chit-chat doesn't facilitate that. There's no direction to it. I never really thought of it that way, but I understand what you mean. Yeah. Okay, uh, here's from the same person, Carrie in Saginaw. Brian, I'm really excited to hear from someone that has experienced Asperger's. Can you explain to us what your life was like growing up and what you feel the most important thing for all of us to remember is? Well, growing up, my life was a nightmare. Uh, I was bullied almost daily. Uh, I was punched in the stomach, uh, spit in my hair, pushed down, called, you know, horrible names, uh, frequent meltdowns. I think the one thing that was my saving grace was the fact that my mother, who is a little eccentric herself, married an Aspie. Me and my two brothers are Aspies. So she got used to being around kids that were different. And she never thought for one moment that her kids were the problem. So she was very supportive of us. And we were all very different, very creative. I was, you know, very much into mimicking and and being you know, copying characters. Uh, One of my other brothers was a musician, so she was able to funnel his creativity into music. So she just kind of took it upon herself to make sure that we were nurtured and supported, and she never once asked us to be other than who we are. And I I think that the greatest gift is in spite of the fact that life was, you know, the outside world didn't accept me, I always felt okay in my mother's eyes. She always let me know I was okay and I was special and that I was intelligent, And hearing that from somebody consistently when the rest of the world wanted me to be otherwise or told me I wasn't good enough, I think that that helped tremendously because, unfortunately, a lot of parents who don't know any better are perpetrating the same thing against their child the rest of the world is. Oh, don't you want to go out and have friends or don't you want to go out and do what the other kids are doing? And they're giving their child the same message that they're not good enough the way they are. So first and foremost, understand that your child is who they are, they're beautiful the way they are, and they have their challenges, yes. But in addressing those challenges, let those things be driven as much by your child's goals as society's goals. Because if it's just about making other people happy, you're going to make your child miserable. Good point. Very good point. Here's a question from Jennifer White in Crystal. 
what are the typical medications used for teens with Asperger's? And she goes on to ask, how does puberty affect medication, and how does puberty affect Asperger's? And her last question is, um, is 13 too old for occupational therapy? Well, there's no such thing as typical medication because it depends on what you're medicating. Are you medicating anxiety? Are you medicating um, depression, uh, aggression, um, bipolar? Because usually the medication is for, it's not for the Asperger's, it's for some other kind of co-occurring issue. Because if you have bipolar that goes on top of it, you're going to have a mood stabilizer. If you have ang anxiety, you're going to have an anti-anxiety. So it's going to be a specific characteristic. And I started getting OT when I was 35. So as long as the, the brain and the nervous system is teachable, which I think is pretty much any time, uh, I had the uh, listening program to kind of help tweak some of my auditory sensitivities. I went through that with an OT when I was 35 years old. So there's really no such thing as uh, too old as far as I'm concerned. And in terms of puberty, uh, one of the, the difficulties you run into, actually a couple of the difficulties, is kids when they're going through puberty have mood swings anyway, whether they're on the spectrum or not. But if you have a child on the spectrum who is a little bit emotionally, you know, kind of sporadic anyway, well, you can count on that increasing. And a bigger problem with puberty is the the social boundaries and those issues when all of a sudden you're attracted to the opposite sex can become a real issue because the boys that are really attracted to the girls don't understand that you can't just reach out and touch someone. So you have to do a lot of education in terms of those boundaries and what the consequences are. So really think that stuff ahead for when you see puberty coming on because this is a conversation that has to be taken very seriously because I have seen teenage boys get brought up on assault charges because they touched a girl because they didn't know better, not because they were sexual deviants.